Well, glad you're here today. Are you glad you're here? Good. We're uh, in a study on the Sermon on the Mount, the first sermon that Jesus ever spoke, ever taught publicly. Uh, in that sermon uh, summarizes the kingdom of heaven. It's an invitation into his kingdom. Uh, it's a sermon on the mount. And today's lesson we're going to be talking about is a, is a lesson about uh, salt and light. And this living in the kingdom is salt and light. We are, you are, we are salt and light. If you have your Bible, I'd like for you to turn to the book of Matthew chapter 5. And while you're turning there, I'm going to pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share your word. And Father, I pray today, our goal, our task, is to project in a better way what you mean, as Jesus said, that we would be salt of the earth and light of the world. Let's go out of here with an understanding of what you're expecting from us, what you expect us to do, and ask you to help us and be with us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, all righty. It was always interesting to me, as I began to see this, that Moses began the law of the Old Covenant. God began it with giving Ten Commandments. Jesus began the New Covenant, the Sermon on the Mount. He began it with eight Beatitudes. It was interesting to me that after the commandments came, after God gave the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, that the people ran. Uh, they did not want to be in the presence of God. They did not want to be uh, in, in, his, in his closeness. He did, they didn't want to be close to him. It, he was, they were afraid. And they ran, and the Bible says they remained at a distance from him. I want to look at that passage. I want to look at that verse just to, just to show you on the screen. It's in Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 through 21. I want to look at that. But we're going to read verses 20 and 21. And it says there, Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Now, please notice that the people are afraid. Moses says, Don't be afraid, but yet God's really wanting to, fr to frighten you so that you'll, stay, you'll not sin. And the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. Now, what was interesting to me about this is, is, that, is that Moses projected God, gave us a portrait of God as a frightening God, uh, the thick darkness. And, and, you know, I was thinking about that just a little bit, and, you know, today is not a whole lot of difference because a lot of times you'll hear about God being a mean, frightening God. And, and you know, it was to keep them from sinning. That's what it said, right? It said, so that you won't sin. Well... Being frightened of God never stopped anyone from sinning. It didn't stop Moses. He struggled with anger all of his life, had situations and relationships with people where he got angry, hit the rock, couldn't go into the land. But yet, he said, God is a frightening God. And the portrait that we have in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament of God, Father God, is a frightening dark God, a one that's going to destroy this earth. But that's not what Jesus gave a picture of. That's not what we're seeing from Jesus. He gave a totally different revelation of God in the New Testament. He's Father. Now, I don't know what kind of father you had, but my father was a very loving, gentle, tender man. And he's a God of love. He's not a God that's out to destroy you or whack you when you mess up. He's out to help you. And give you love. He's out to, to make life tasteful for you. Abundant. He's out to warm us with his light. And that's what Jesus wants you and I to give people the world, the earth. He wants us to portray God that way as well. He's not in thick darkness. He's in bright light. 
He's not a God that wants to frighten you. He's a God that wants to love you. Jesus didn't want us doing that. He didn't preach it that way. He didn't preach Father God that way, and neither is it how you and I are to portray God. We are to portray God as a loving Father, a God that wants to give us a taste for life, a God that wants to lead us with light and enter into his light, not his darkness, a God that wants us in his presence, not fearful and running from his presence, rather as destruction preserving, rather as fearful loving. And that's what he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. And let's read that. He says, You, Jesus said this, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hid. See, we're, sh we're to show God as light as something that adds flavor and taste to life. He's a salty God. <laughs> He's a God that adds preserving powers to our life and, and a God that adds flavor to our life. Now, the Greek words here are extremely interesting to me that Jesus used. Uh, and I want to I talk about them briefly because they are so interesting. Earth, you're the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. I want to talk about that from the Greek just, just a little bit. The, the, the Greek word for earth is the word gay, and it's spelled G-E, but it's pronounced gay. And what it means is the ground, the earth as a standing place, the main land as opposed to the sea or water, a country, land enclosed within fixed boundaries, a tract of land, territory, or a region. Now, what it doesn't mean is this globe that we're gravitated to. When, when Jesus speaks of, of, the, of the earth here, he's not talking about this globe that you and I are stuck to. That's not what he's talking about. At its largest expanse, this particular word means the land that is separated from water. But basically, it usually means a cultivated area on which you stand. Uh, the, but the best way to show you what this word means, and it's extremely interesting in the book of Revelation, when you really understand what this word means, because it's the same word that's used, oh, no, 20, 30 times in the book of Revelation. It's the, it's the, it's the earth where all the plagues come, and the, and, the, and the trumpets are sounding, and the, and the vials are poured upon, and the four horsemen ride through. This is the place, this is the earth that is spoken of in the book of Revelation. So it becomes extremely interesting and important to understand what it means. So there's 251 uses of it. You can find it 251 times in, the, in, the, in your Bible, in the New Testament, if you want to. But I'm going to show you two, two scriptures, and you can, you can do the research for yourself. It's not very difficult to find this word. But I want to show you two scriptures just to kind of get our, our, our heads on the thought of what Jesus is, is talking about. So the first one that I want to look at is Matthew chapter 2, verse 6. Matthew 2, 6. Here it says, And thou Bethlehem, in the land, that's the gay, of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Now this is the first use. That word land is the same word that Jesus used, but it is translated earth. You are the salt of the earth. It's not talking about the globe. You and I are not responsible to salt this globe. What we are responsible to salt is the land on which we stand. What we are responsible to touch with the salt that we are of, we're, we're responsible to touch the people that we come in contact with. Now, this is the first use of this word gay in the, in the Scriptures. Now, if you're a Bible student, you know the importance of, of first use. First use is the seed use. First use is, is from the seed that every other use will come from. It's like the first grain of corn. Every other grain of corn, every plant of corn, every corn plant has its DNA located back into that first seed. So what we begin to see then is with this seed word of gay, it relates all the way back to this particular thought of this particular land out of Bethlehem, out of a city, would come the Savior, would come Jesus. So we're not talking about the earth as a globe. We're talking about a region in which you and I exist in. This is, this is what the thought is. So let's look at another one. 
In, the, in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 31, it says, But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country, or all that gay. Again, it's not the globe, it's a country. And the NIV Bible translates it even as region. Region. So what we are able to do is spread ab abroad his fame in the region where we go. We are not responsible to salt this whole earth. You and I aren't, but we are responsible, and he does expect us to salt every place that we go. And I think that's extremely important, and I think that's in, it, it, it brings it down to a place where I can handle it. We are the salt of our regions. We are, we are the salt of the places that we go. We are the salt of our cities. We are the salt of this, what, where God has put us in this northwest Georgia corner. That's what we're responsible to salt. That's what we're responsible to flavor. That's what we are responsible to make thirsty. He said it like this. Jesus said to his disciples, Go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts. Take care of your place first. Take care of your area first. The truth of the fact is, is, is that we can never salt the earth until we first salt our region. We can never salt our region until we first salt our families. And to do that, we've got to have a salty church. The truth of the fact is, is that if we're not a salty church, we're not a church at all. What good is it if a salt just stays in its container? We'll get there in just a second. So let's talk about some uses of salt. Let's talk about some uses that when Jesus spoke this on that mountain that day, when people were coming to hear him and wanting the presence of God from what he said, let's talk about the uses of salt of that day. And I want to give you an illustration, but I, but I really want us to understand. There are three basic types of uses of salt, three basic uses of salt that was used in that day, still used today the same way. But in that particular day, the one that was, was the most used, and I think the most referred to here by Jesus, was, was, a, was a type that I'm going to show you in just a second. But I think this speaks of three primary types of people that we meet. I think this is three primary ways that we salt people. The first one is to preserve. Now, they had no refrigeration in that day. But the first use of salt in that day was as a preservative. As it is today, it was then, when an animal was butchered, if it was not cold, flies and insects and everything came immediately. And within a few hours, that meat was ruined. And it began to deteriorate and to rot. Even in the wintertime, if it were cold, it would still begin to deteriorate after a short period of time. And so what they would do is take salt as a preservative and work it and rub it into the meat. Now, stay with me. I'm going to show you this thought because this is not sprinkling. This is, this is salt. I have here a big old piece of meat. We have a butcher, there's an elder, and I got him to get this for us. Now, this is not sprinkling. This does no good if I want to preserve this meat. It might flavor it a little bit if I'm going to cook it, but if I want to preserve this meat, I have got to really put some salt on it. And I have got to begin to work that in. Now, some of you are too young to know this, but when I was a kid growing up, we used to butcher hogs. We would get a cold day, and we would butcher hogs, and then we would take the meat after we had salted it, and we would put it in boxes of salt. We would actually submerge it in salt after it had been rubbed down. But this entire piece of meat is rubbed all over. Every crack, every place that you can get salt into is salted. And if you don't, it will ruin. So it's, it's, it's a lot of salt, and it's totally put on this piece of meat. I'm going to need some tissues, and I did not get that. All right. Good. But now I want you to see this is a vigorous rubbing. This is, this is a little bit laborious. It's not a sprinkle. This is serious rubbing. You've got to work at it a little bit. And it becomes salted. Now, what fly in the world would want to land on this thing? You know? And it's going to last for a long, long time. Thank you. Got some wipies. Good. Yeah. Now, this is a type of people that we meet. 
it's the kind of a person that we're allowed to rub into. We're al allowed to touch their lives in a very vigorous way on a regular basis. Jesus touched his disciples this way. He didn't touch everyone this way, but he was able to touch his disciples. He was able to vigorously spend time with them. He was able to really work on their lives. He was able to salt them thoroughly and tell them about every nook and cranny. He was able to share with them the whole intention of his kingdom. And we have people, you and I have people like that that we meet on a regular basis, nearly every day. We can work with them, we can live with them, we can raise them. We see them on a consistent basis, nearly daily. And God has given us the opportunity to really salt their lives, rub it into their flesh. Work it into them. It will become a part of them. See, that's what happened to you and I. Somewhere, somewhere along the way, we got rubbed in. The salt of the kingdom became a part of our lives. And what we have opportunity to do with some people, not every person, but with some people, we have the opportunity to spend a lot of time with them, to vigorously work into their flesh, our lives, into their lives. We have become a part of them, just as that salt is now a part of that piece of meat. And we've, and we've been able to do that with these people. Now you can't do that with everybody. But Jesus did this with his disciples. He worked himself into those disciples' souls, into their lives, into their thought processes. That's what makes us salty. That's what makes you and me salty. That's what make, made them salty. Now what... What is it that, I want to work on this just a little bit. What is it that makes us salty? Now, what I'm trying to say here is, let me get, ask you some questions and you'll understand better what I'm trying to say. Are we salty because I prayed a sinner's prayer? Does that make me salty? Does it make me salty because I come to church on Sundays? Does that make me salty? What about if I, if I pay my tithes? Now, I know that's going to make me salty, right? You know, I know people that do, all of those. A lot of people do. But they never influence anyone's life. In fact, they're obnoxious, repulsive. And I don't want them rubbing on me. I don't want them rubbing on my family. I don't want them rubbing on my kids. I don't want anything about their life intruding into mine. Now, they pray to prayer. They may give to the kingdom. They may go to church every Sunday but I don't want them influencing my life. And actually, I don't want them influencing yours because what they have is not the salt of the kingdom. So what is it then that makes us salty? What is it? Is it Jesus? Is it Jesus? Well, kind of, but I know a lot of people that say they know Jesus and that Jesus is in their life, but again, I don't want them in my life. I don't want them rubbing in me what they have. So what is it? What is it that really makes us salt of the earth? What is it? Can I answer you? Can I tell you? You ready? Attitudes. All that Jesus has talked about so far is attitudes. If those eight attitudes are in our life, not the Ten Commandments, but the eight attitudes, if they are in our life, and we've spent a lot of time talking about these eight attitudes, and the reason is, is because the eight attitudes, blessed attitudes, beautiful attitudes, are to the New Covenant, to the New Testament, what the Ten Commandments were to the Old. And I want us to get that so desperately, because if you don't have the right attitudes, nobody wants you around, much less messing with their life. But if you have these things working in you, you have these eight beautiful attitudes coming out of your life, blessed are the poor in spirit, you got a right spirit, you're not full of yourself, you're going to be full of him, people will start liking you. They don't like somebody that's full of themselves. Blessed, blessed are they that mourn, when a person that mourns when they do something wrong to, to, to against God or against people, they mourn and they're sorry for it, truly sorry, not just words, but they really are sorry and not do it again. You want that person around you. Blessed are the meek, the person that somehow is able to approach every situation with a meekness, with a controlled strength, a person that is able to approach every situation in life properly. Well, you can use that person in your life. What about a person that hungers and thirsts for righteousness? 
Not just for God, but for righteousness, to live life right. That they want to do things right. They don't want to mess with people. They don't want to talk about people. They don't want to slander people. They don't want to do things wrong. They want to do things right. You want somebody like that around you. What about, what about a, a person who keeps their heart pure? You know, blessed are the pure in heart. You have an attitude that you want your heart to stay right with God and right with people. Blessed are the pure in heart. What about blessed are the merciful? You want a person, don't you like people around you that have mercy on you when you goof up? Or, or, or have mercy on other people that don't slander and backbite and talk and go off on things? Peacemakers, like those? I like them around. Blessed are the peacemakers. I like people that when they get persecuted, when they get talked about for the sake of their, of their faith in Jesus Christ, that it does not stop them. It actually encourages them. Blessed are those persecuted. See, with these attitudes functioning in our life, we're irresistible. People want you against them. People want you in their homes. They want you talking to their kids. They want you ministering to them. You're not repulsive. You're desirous. And that's what we're supposed to project God as. Not as a mean, hating, hating mean God who's ready to whack us if we mess up, but a loving Father with right attitudes. That's what makes us salty. <laughs> people enjoy that. We rub people the wrong way, or we rub people the right way with our attitudes. Am I right? Is this correct? Is this good preaching? You see, if you ever, if you, ever you know, you're rubbing me the wrong way. Well, you know what's happened? Is you don't like their attitude. But when you get along with somebody and you want to be around somebody, you like their attitude. And you want to be around them and you want them influencing in your life. So who are you rubbing salt on? Who are you vigorously working the salt of Jesus into their life? The salt that you are. He didn't say he's the salt. He said you're the salt. Who are you working your life into? Who are you around that much? It should be people that you see regularly. At work or at home or wherever that you go on a consistent basis. But you should be rubbing the attitudes of Christ into their lives and blessing them. Now, I have one more thought on this preser preservation thought before I move on to the second use of salt. But, but, this, but, this, but this particular thought is about the preserving, so I need to fit it in right here. Uh, you see, Jesus said the salt is to preserve the earth. You, you are the salt of the earth. But contrary to that, there is a, a lot of doctrinal teaching that says that God is going to destroy the earth. Now, I have a problem. The problem I have is this, is that I'm going to give my life to preserve something that he's going to destroy? Does that add up to you? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You're the salt, you're the preserving force of this earth. And folks, let me tell you, Jesus never taught that. Jesus never taught about destroying the earth. He's all about preserving it. He talks about a God, a Father, that wants to preserve your life and my life, your soul, my soul, your spirit, my spirit. He wants this thing preserved. In fact, he says, occupy until I come. Let's move from that direction. We can't miss it then, right? So let's look at the second use of salt in the scriptures, or the salt in the time that Jesus uh, was, uh, was, was sharing this and, and teaching this. The second use of salt is, is a condiment, is a spice. Uh, adds flavor. It adds flavor. Uh, you can put salt on anything and it will enhance the flavors, whether it's a vegetable, even bread. You put a dash of salt in bread and it brings out flavors that you can't taste. It removes the blandness. You can overdo it. But for the most part, the right amount of sprinkled salt on anything adds a flavor. You see, Christianity should bring a flavor to the earth. 
should bring a flavor to your gay, a flavor to your earth. You should add a flavor that's not there if you're not. You should show the joy of the Lord, the, the goodness of God. You should add a flavor that's not there when you're not there. You should be missed. I, when I eat something and it's not salted, I miss that salt. Do you? It becomes bland. See, my li a lot of people think that Christianity is this bland thing, a life of commandments. No, it's not a life of commandments. It's a life of attitudes. Uh, this, this flat, bland thing that thou shalt... No, it's not it at all. Man, Jesus loved to party. Did he? Come on. It, he was not bland. He was not flat. He was a flavorful guy. And people loved to be around him because he sprinkled salt on people. Not literally. You understand what I'm talking about. But every place he'd go, he would sprinkle. He would sprinkle people. Sprinkle salt. Um, you know, I think you've seen Christians like, you know, look down their noses, as it were, at sinners or even sometimes at other Christians. You know, they're better than. It's the holier than thou thing. You know, I'm going to heaven and you're going to hell. Ha ha. Kind of thing. See, that's not New Testament. You should add a flavor that they want. You should have something that they don't. And we should be sprinkling people every place we go. Every place we go. I sprinkle salt. I'll just leave a trail of salt everywhere I go. I, 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 you know, if, if I go to the bank, I'm sprinkling salt. I'm smiling. I'm giving an encouraging word. Most people around here know who I am. We go to a restaurant. They watch to see if we pray before we eat. They, you know, I'm sprinkling salt. How I respond to my grandkids. Do my grandkids mind in a restaurant? Do, uh, you know, how do I respond to my wife, to people? I'm sprinkling salt. I go to a hardware store or to a convenience store, I sprinkle salt. I smile, give an encouraging word. And if at all possible, I give an invitation to come. Uh, this happened to me Friday, actually. Uh, I do it all the time, but this particular thing just comes to my mind. I was, uh, we had made the cards that uh, Steve was telling you about just a minute ago, the invitation cards for Christmas. And uh, I had them over at the print shop. And so they delivered them Friday during the, during the uh, parade. And so I couldn't go get them, so they just brought them to me. And she brought them in. And I just gave her a big old smile and a big thank you for coming and bringing this and doing this for me. And I hugged her and, you know, and I said, you know, where do you go to church? I had her right in here. I mean, you know, it's pretty. Where do you go to church? Oh, I live along. I said, well, maybe you can come visit us sometime. But you see, Jesus sprinkled everybody. He sprinkled everybody. Now, he didn't, he didn't rub salt into everybody, but he would sprinkle the multitudes. He would, he would make God tasteful to every person. No matter who he met or where they were, he would make God tasteful, not bland. God of love and light, not a God of darkness and fear. So let's look at the third use. So who are you sprinkling on? It should be everybody. Right. So the third use. The third use is we make people thirsty. Salt makes us thirsty. Thirsty. Uh, you know, I get around people that I make thirsty. Now, most of the time, these are believers. Most of the time, the people that I make thirsty for God are already believers of God. Uh, not always, but usually. Uh, you know, they're, 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 they're looking for something more. They're wanting something more. They're thirsty for something. They just don't know exactly what it is. Uh, uh, and, 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 and I make preachers thirsty. And preachers make me thirsty. You know, I, was, I spent the, the other afternoon with, with Scott Webster. Most of you, many of you know him. He's a, he's a prophetic ministry. And I spent lunch with him. And he was making me thirsty and I was making him thirsty. You know, you, and you leave out of there thirsting for more of God. And Jesus did this. Jesus made people thirsty. You know, Nicodemus, now his doctrine was all a mess, but he made Nicodemus thirsty for God. How about the woman at the well? Remember the woman at the well? He made her thirsty. She, was, she believed in God. She worshipped him on some mountain. Doctrine all messed up, but he offered her living water. See, 
we can offer them not only salt to make them thirsty, but like Jesus, give them living water to quench that thirst. And I tell people about LifeGate. I tell them about our praise and worship. I tell them about the dance things that we do sometimes and the illustrations that we use sometimes. And, and I talk to people all the time about you. I make them thirsty for something like LifeGate. I make them thirsty. I tell people in convenience stores or tellers or whatever, but I'm always, I'm always sprinkling salt and I'm always attempting to make people thirsty. Tell them about what we're learning. Tell them about what we're doing. You get thirsty. I get thirsty. Who are you causing to be thirsty? Who are you causing to want a drink of living water? Should be. Should be doing that especially to people who are looking for more of God. People who want to be thirsty for God. Now, we have all three of those types of people in our lives. All of us do. Every single person has people that we spend a lot of time with that we really work vigorously and rub salt into. We all have people that we can sprinkle on. We all have people that we can just go around and add a little flavor, give them a smile, give them an encouraging word, but just make their life good for them. Make it tasteful. Make them, make them enjoy you being there with them. And then we all have people that we should be making thirsty. How are we doing? How's your earth? How's your gate? How's the land you stand on? Is it salty? Should be. In fact, it must be. How salty are we? Let's look at uh, 513 one more time. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. See, if salt remains in its container, what good is it? We're all salty, and salt really never does lose its ability to salt unless it doesn't get out of the container. The salt in that box does that meat no good. The salt in the shaker does your food no good. Staying in the container, we make no one thirsty. Well, we might make each other a little thirsty. But Jesus says, if that's all you're doing, you're really good for nothing. Hmm. Can a person, can a church lose their saltiness? Yes, in that we never get out of our container. See, salt really doesn't lose its saltiness. But a church that is not salty, hear me, is good for nothing. Ouch. As I saw that, as I began to, to look at that, I said, oh my. Oh my. And over the years, we've had a tendency to stay in our container. We're starting to sprinkle some now. We're starting to rub some now. And things are changing. But isn't that what Jesus is saying? If you're just going to lose your saltiness, if you're not going to be, you're good for nothing except to be walked, thrown out on the streets, and at least maybe you'll stop some weeds from growing. If you're really not doing for his kingdom what he expects what he desires and, and, and thinks that we should do. Now, just to make us, make us aware that our saltiness determines our destiny, our church, the destiny of LifeGate is determined by our saltiness. Uh, what happened to those great churches that we read about in here? What happened to the churches like at Ephesus or at uh, Corinth or Thessalonica? What happened to those great churches? What happened to the seven great churches that are mentioned in the book of Revelation, that the book of Revelation was actually written to? What happened to those churches? They're not in existence anymore. Do you know why? They lost their saltiness. See, our destiny is determined by our ability to remain salty. You and I, each of us, determines whether we'll be here a hundred years from now or not. What happens to churches that begin but have to close the doors? What happened to the great cathedrals in England? Great cathedrals built to last forever, boarded up windows and nailed shut doors now. Why? Because they lost their saltiness. They're, they lost their ability to rub on people, to add life, add flavor to life, and to make people thirsty for God. So our future is dependent upon our saltiness. Who are you salty? 
Who are you affecting their lives? Is there anyone? Do you have a list of people that you're going to attempt to see this week and rub on or sprinkle on or try to make thirsty for God? Do you have a list? Do you have anybody? Is there anyone that you're really doing what Jesus says that we are to do? Are we just staying in the container? Now, look at 514. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. I want to just emphasize that particular part. It's impossible to hide a city on a hill. It's, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, it's impossible for you not to shine. It's impossible for us to hide our lights. A thought here is, is that he says, you are the light of the world. What I want us to see is, is that without the church, without the kingdom of God in the earth today, the earth is in total darkness. Without us, without the church, without the kingdom, there's nothing but darkness. Jesus says, we're a city on a hill, and it can't be hidden. See, a true church cannot be hidden. We're going to be talked about. We're going to be persecuted. But we're going to be seen. And if we're not being persecuted, we're not a church. And if we're not being seen, we're not a church. We're just playing some sort of a game. We've got to be salty. Now those listening to Jesus on the hillside that day did not think of lights as electrical. They, they did not associate electricity as do we with lights. Their image is a flame. Their image of light is a torch. On the day of Pentecost, and that's why I had them do this dance this morning, on the day of Pentecost, a ball of fire came into that house. And that, then the Bible says that that ball of fire divided or separated. And cloven tongues, like as fire, came and set upon each person. Came and set upon every person in that house. Everyone present there. They didn't run from it. They were sitting there waiting on it. They desired it. And they became flames of light. They found others to rub against and to catch on fire. And they were not hidden. And eventually that flame went through the whole earth. Eventually that flame came and set upon you and set upon me. And now it's up to us to pass that flame on. But I want to give you an example. I want to give us a visual of the flame. And I've never done this before, and it's a little bit dangerous, but we're going to give it a whirl, okay? I, I, I'm going to give us some, some fire, because I really want us to see what Jesus is trying to express to us here. So, stay with me. <laughs> now, in a few minutes... A few minutes, five of you guys are going to come up here with me. When you come, I'm going to give you instruction. When you come, pick you, pick you a, a torch out of here. And I want the lights out. I want total darkness in here. When Jesus was talking about a flame, this is what he's talking about. And he says, you're a light of the world. This is what he's saying. I have a fire extinguisher. And I'm dripping. <laughs> so bring me, a, bring me a, that bucket over here. Bring me that water thing. But we should do that. I mean, this, it's, it's lighter fluid, so it's gonna go, it goes out. So we're cool. But I do have them soaking. Now, if you other guys will come up here that I've asked you to come. What we are to do, is pass our flame. <laughs> Doug, pass your flame to Willis. Let it drip on the floor, it'll go out. 
Hey, you come over. No, walk over here. Be fine. I'm going to pass my flame to Steve. Now, do you see how much light we have? I can see you. It's totally dark in here. But I can see each one of your faces. And I know you can see us. <laughs> and when that, when that club, when that ball of fire came in, those people became flames. How many knows this is a little hard to hide this thing? <laughs> you, you don't put a bucket on top of this. And whatever I get around, I'm going to catch it on fire. It's a warm, it's a warm glow. It's a good thing. And this is the image that Jesus wants us to see. He's not talking about turning a light switch on. He's talking about a fire, a hot fire, that when you get up against somebody, when you touch someone's life, you catch them on fire. You're the light of the world. And whatever you get around, whoever, whomever you get around, you're to catch them on fire. You're to bring them to God. Is that good? You like that? All right. Okay. You give me some lights. Go ahead. Now, while they're putting all that out, don't get close to this one. <laughs> uh, don't, don't drop anything in that bucket. But you know, I've talked about that for years, that Jesus wants us to understand what he's saying here. We have this, this warm thing, you know, of, of, of a light bulb, you know, in our minds. But what I want us to get is in our, in our imaging, in our, in our thinking, is, is what Jesus is saying here. You're a torch. A city that's got a lot of these is impossible to hide. A church like this that's on fire, a church like that that's catching everybody on fire, I'm telling you, that's what he's talking about. That's what it's about. My life getting against your life and, and your life getting against someone else's life. And, and then before long, this whole thing spreads in this whole northwest Georgia corner. All the way from Somerville, Port Fort Payne, Ringgold, uh, I'm gonna, Trenton, all these, every place that we go to, every place that we live in, every place that we go out of here with our flame and our salt, that we go and we affect something. We affect somebody. We catch them on fire. We preserve their lives. We make things tasteful for them. That's what he's talking about. And a big fire cannot be hid. A church on fire, you're going to hear about. A church on fire is going to win people to Jesus. A church on fire is going to do a lot in, its king, in, the, in, the, in the earth for the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't know what's ahead for us. I don't know what's ahead. I know that this, this past year, we did more flaming than we've ever done in our, in our history. We touched more lives. We, we did more exposure than we've ever done. But I do know this. I do know that we've got to be on fire. Because if we're not, we're good for nothing. If all we do is light a torch like this and make an example, but if we become the torch. Now let me show you this Greek word for, for light of the world. Cosmos is the word that's translated world in that verse. And here's what it means to us. It means arrangement. It means order to the government. It means the whole circle of things. Cosmos. It has this kind of a sound to it, doesn't it, that uh, sounds, sounds kind of uh, universal, cosmos. And that's exactly the thought. It's the circle of things. It's the orbit. It's how things are set in motion. You are the light of the arrangement of things. You're the light of the world, the cosmos. The earth, it's amazing. Of course, it was just a big bang. Started it all according to the scientists. But think about this. Just, for, just this part. You know, there's this sun that sits there. And this earth orbits around the sun. And the moon orbits around the earth. And all of this is going in a circle. It's a circle of things. It's the arrangement of things. And this sun brings light to this world. Even the little moon gets its light from the sun. And what Jesus is saying, I want my kingdom to be at the center. I want you at the center of the world. And I want everything orbiting around my kingdom. I want you bringing light to everything. I want you affecting everything with warmth. I want you bringing seasons. I want you controlling everything. I want my kingdom right in the center of everything that's happening. And the arrangements of things. You know, 
I was thinking about this, laying in the bed, this, this, this thing, how God has put this in motion and this whole orbit of things. You know, a lot of people blame God for what's happening to them. No, it's just the way it's set in motion. Everything's on its own. It circles around. It has to. Uh, be not deceived. God's not mocked for whatever a man sows. It's going to circle back around. You sow to the flesh, corruption, then that's what you reap back. You sow to the spirit, good stuff, then that's what you reap back. Because it's what it circles around. Uh, do not judge for the same measure that you judge others, it's going to be coming back around again. And, and, and this is how it works. And what God wants is a people, a son in the center, a kingdom in the center of everything, so that he can show people how life works. To give light, to give warmth, to give instructions. That's what he says. You're the light of the world. You're the light of the cosmos. You're the light of my arrangement. Everything that I've arranged, I've arranged around you. You're to give warmth and light and understanding. Light in the scripture speaks of understanding. We should have a light. The word of God is a light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. Because it tells me how I live. It tells me how to walk through life. He says, that's what I want you to be. I want you to be the light of the world. He desires a kingdom that's a cosmos, that lights the cosmos. Now, the Bible says here in this verse, in, in verse 15, it says that, that you know, it, it, everything is strategically placed. Let's, let's read that verse in verse 15. Neither do people light a lamp, a torch or, or a lamp in a house, and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. Where do they put it? Put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. Now, what, what I want us to see here is, is that God has, he's the householder. He's, he, he owns this thing. You know, this is, this is his kingdom. And he has strategically placed you and I on a stand. You and I aren't happen chance going through life here. God has strategically, he, if we're his, then he has told us who we should like. He has put us on a stand so that we'll bring light to everybody that's around us. He, he has strategically located you with specific people. Just like, just like with the salt. There are specific people that you're around to salt. There are specific people that God's put you on a stand to light. This is how it works. He's not going to put a bucket over us. He's not going to put a bowl over us to hide us. He doesn't want your life hid. He wants your life in its most dominant place. And he's strategically put you in his house where you'll do the most good, where you'll bring the most warmth, where you'll give the most light. And the people that you're around need you. The people that I'm around need me. I can add something to their life. I can give them light. I can give them salt. But if I don't get out of my container, and if I keep a bowl over my light, I am no good. What good are you? He's not put this church under a bucket. We are not going to live under a bucket. We're not hiding we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not ashamed of the word that he's given us to preach of his kingdom. We're going to shine as never before like a flame on fire every place we go. And this year you're going to meet people. This coming year, from now on, you're going to meet people that you're going to catch on fire. Look at verse 16, because this is exactly what he says in verse 16, what I just said to you. In the same way, what, in the same way of what? Putting it on its stand. In the same way, let your light shine before men. That they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. In the same way, God has strategically placed you on a stand. Now, according to that verse, how do we shine? 
According to what Jesus said, how does my light shine? Now you got your Bible right there. I want you to tell me what that verse says. What does that verse say? How do people see my light? By your good deeds. See, people are watching you. Jesus said, people see you by your deeds, by your good deeds. Not by what you say, but by what you do. Not by what we say we are, but by the attitudes that we operate our lives by. People notice how we live. They take notice of it. They take note of it. They see how we pay our bills. They see how we raise our children. How we respond to our spouses. They watch our lives. They see what we do for others or what we won't do for others. Now people do this whether you are a Christian or not. It doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or not. People always see how other people live. You don't have to be a Christian just to be taken notice of. So what Jesus is saying here, why don't you use that? Use that as a light. Shine it out there. Let people see how you live. Let people see how I've blessed you. Let people see how you respond to your, to your, to your families, how you, how you do your life. Let people see that. Because that's how you'll bring praise to our Father in heaven. See, we're going to be, bring praise to one or the other. We're going to bring praise to our Father in heaven, or we're going to bring praise to the devil. It's according on what our light shines. So, we are the salt of the earth, are we? Are we? Are we going to preserve the earth? Are we going to preserve somebody? Do we add flavor to life? Is your life flavorful? Mine is. We make people thirsty for God. Do you? Is there anyone right now that you're really wanting to make thirsty for God? We're the light of the world. We bring light into darkness. That one flame lit this whole room up. We bring light into darkness where we work, where we live, whatever we do. We give direction. We're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And we're strategically located. Each one of us are around the very people God wants us to influence. Either to light their lives or to rub salt into them. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Let's pray. Father, help us. Become so on fire for you that when we walk into a room, it begins to warm, it begins to have light. Let our lives get out of a container. Let our lives rub against others to preserve them. Let us add flavor. Let us make people thirsty. Because if we don't, what good are we? Help each one of us, Lord, to see this. Help us be what we need to be for you and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you just to keep your heads bowed just for a second. I just want to ask you a question. We're about to the end of this year. And the New Year's coming. And a lot of times we make resolutions, New Year's resolutions. You know, we're going to lose weight or we're going to do something. How many of you would make a resolution with me that, as never before, I'm going to be salt and light? I am going to do the very best I can to influence as many lives as I can, be as sprinkly as I can, to, to make people thirsty for God and to catch people on fire for God. I'm going I'm to make it a resolution of my life. I'm going to purpose to do it. 
See, I had to purpose to put that salt on that meat. I had to purpose to light that fire. How many of you will purpose in your life in these next months, these next years, to do what we're called and destined to do? Would you raise your hand if this is you? Amen.